Slow news day around these parts. <laughs> yeah, right. Michigan State adds four commits in the last two days. Jeremy fears he gets his red shirt. And Michigan State, Notre Dame, the megaphone game. Welcome back in our lives. Let's go. You are locked on Spartans. Your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Spartans is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to. Well, the summer keeps rolling out with FanDuel. They're hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked on Spartans listeners. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Locked on Spartans. Your team in green and white five days a week. In August, September, October, right now in June and July, we're doing three days a week. But before we even know it, we will be back to five days a week here. Please rate, review, subscribe. Any questions? Locked on Spartans at gmail.com. Got a few mailbag shows coming up in the future. So if you want to shout at us, locked on Spartans at gmail.com is the place to find us. All right, let's get into the mix here. And so much for slow days in the summer for an old college sports podcast because. My goodness gracious to Jonathan Smith and company reel in some talent in the last 48 hours. They got not one, not two, not three, but four commits for the 2025 class. We're going to start where it all began. We're going to go through the defensive side of the ball here for the first three, actually. The first guy, Aiden West, six foot, 185 pound cornerback out of Maryland. Uh, plays for Quince Orchard, which they, they went nine and one last year. So he plays some good football on a good team. Plays a little bit of nickel, plays some safety too, it appears, based on the film that we've seen. So straight up secondary player. Now, per rivals, he's the number 69 rated overall corner in the country and the number 19 rated kid in the state of Maryland. He also took official visits to Virginia, West Virginia, Cincinnati, and Wake Forest. Now, down at the end, he told Spartans Illustrated that he was between the Spartans, which, of course, you know how this goes. He does commit to East Lansing and Jonathan Smith. Or Cincinnati was the other school saying, quote, I could see myself succeeding at both places, Michigan State and Cincinnati, but I put my trust into God and he led me toward Michigan State. So that really all it was. So shout out to the man above being the primary recruiter here. We love to see that. Cincinnati had a lot of things, really everything you need to be successful also, but Michigan State just came out on top because I built a genuine relationship with most of the coaches, not just my position coach, but most of the coaches. So there you have it. Again, versatile secondary player. Based on what we've seen in the transfer portal when they were bringing in guys like Nikai Martinez, like Legend Cavazos, the staff seems to like them guys that could be a pawn and be used all over the secondary. So Aiden West, no different right there. So for secondary recruiting, well, in the class of 2025, he joins George Mullins, who committed earlier this week out of Florida. I love his game. You heard me talk about him. Great ball skills. He knows what's happening before the offense even knows what's happening, seemingly. So two good secondary pieces right there from last year's class. You got just one secondary player. That was Justin Denson. Profiles as more of a safety. And, of course, you know, you got a young transfer in Jeremiah Hughes, the true freshman at LSU. But that's just the young guys coming in to be the nucleus of the secondary in the future as things stand right now. Now, we're going to go inside the trenches here for this next commit. This is Cal Thrush. He commits as a six foot four, 250 pound defensive end from the state of Ohio. And it'll be interesting to see where he plays here because obviously, strong side defensive end right now, as he's built, as he plays too in high school. But by all accounts, maybe could add on 20 pounds, maybe be up to like that 270, 275 pound mark. And at that point, six foot four, 275. I mean, you're, you could very well be an interior defensive lineman. So it'll be interesting to see where they put Cal Thrush in his career. Michigan State was the only power for school he officially visited, but he will be adding uh, his name to Kikai Burnett, uh, who was, you know, defensive end out of Hawaii in last year's class. And then Mike Schoenbeeler, defensive tackle out of last year's class, too. So that's where it is. Now, as far as 2025 recruiting goes, Brad Fitzgibbon, he was an interior defensive lineman. He visited earlier this month to East Lansing. He committed to Iowa recently. So that's got to be it for 2025, right? <laughs> yeah, right. 
Nope, that is uh, not the case here with the defensive line because it actually just a little bit before we started recording here, out of Frankenmuth, that is right, Barbarian in and Zenders fed. Derek Simmons, he commits to Michigan State, six foot three, 270 pound defensive tackle from Frankenmuth. Who, which by the way, you know, pretty solid year for them last year, 48 tackles, 15 tackles for loss, and five sacks. He picks Michigan State over Cincinnati, over Purdue, over Illinois. So not a bad pickup for Michigan State right there. He is the number 10 kid in the state per rivals. He's the number 39 ranked defensive tackle per rivals. And guys, when you watch his film on Huddle or YouTube, whatever medium you want, Oh, yeah, you you get a nasty streak of a player. This is exactly the kind of kid that you want in the trenches. Now, up at Frankenmuth, he plays both defensive line and offensive line. He's coming here as a defensive lineman, but, man, the, the first clip you see in his junior highlights, I, I don't laugh a lot while I watch high school films. I audibly laughed out loud. He absolutely ragdolled this kid, threw him five yards into his other teammate, uh, the opponent's teammate, that is, and... This is, a, this is a mean kid on the football field. I'm sure he's very pleasant off the field, but, whoo, man, this is exactly what you want for a defensive lineman. Now, at Frankenmuth, he'll line up over the tackle on the inside shoulder. Like, this isn't a kid that is just a run-stopping defensive tackle just because he's bigger than everyone else and because he takes up a lot of space. Now, he plays, just like I've said a few times, he plays with aggression. This is a ball-hawking defensive tackle, and one that is very active with his hands, too. So it's not just the run-stopping. I could see this guy being very active on the pass rush on the interior offensive line. So that is a nice little pickup for Joe Rossi, for Jonathan Smith, for the whole Michigan State staff, keeping him in state in Frankmuth, you know, despite hard uh, pursuits from Cincinnati, Purdue, and Illinois. So those are your three defensive commits right there in the last 48 hours. We got one more. On the offensive side of the ball, it is impossible to miss this kid because it's Justin Bell, six foot eight, two hundred eighty eight pound kid out of Macomb, Dakota, and well, this was probably like the worst kept secret uh, of the week as far as Michigan State recruiting goes because he was supposed to um, officially visit Kansas last weekend. Michigan State they offered him recently. They get him on campus. He cancels the Kansas official visit. My goodness gracious! It seems like a lot of smoke is blowing over to Michigan State, and all that the Spartans have to do is. Just make sure he doesn't get flattened by a moped on Shaw Lane, and you will probably get his commitment. Uh, it looks like he wants to be a Spartan, and yeah, the visit went great. So now you get the second commit from Macomb, Dakota, linebacker Damari Malone being the other. And you know, point blank, I, this kid grew up a Spartan fan, and he told the fine folks at Spartans Illustrated as much, saying, quote, when Michigan State offered me, it was a dream come true because I have been a fan of them ever since I was a little kid. And just being able to have the opportunity to play for them was mind-blowing for me, Bell explained. Again, Spartans Illustrated on that one. So not just awesome for Michigan State fans, for us to get a six foot eight, two 288 pound offensive tackle. So in that, Jim Maholchek, the offensive line coach, can mold like he's done so well the last few years over at Oregon State. More on that in a little bit. Right now, Per 24-7 sports, he's the number 1,205th overall uh, player in the country, the number 90-ranked offensive tackle. You might be saying to yourself, well, okay, great. That's actually pretty high ranks. I, why are you so excited about this? But I'm actually going to tell you why that you can and should just put your faith in Jim Holchek and trust his eyes when it comes to offensive line recruiting, more specifically offensive tackle recruiting here in a hot segment. First, guys, need to talk your ears off about eBay Motors. If you need car parts, <laughs> eBay Motors is the place to go. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Guys, we're talking superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, so much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, point blank, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts. I'll say that one more time. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you are looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or it's your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need, the prices you want, 
it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home the huge win. So what are you waiting for out there? Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's keep on rocking and rolling here. And we're going to keep the Justin Bell conversation going specifically what Jim Holchek can do with guys that are ranked outside the top 800 that come to schools that he coaches at. Because, hey, you know what? Jim Holchek, he comes to Michigan State, follows Jonathan Smith from Oregon State staff. And well, you hear a lot of people, myself included, saying, well, this guy's the cat's pajamas when it comes to offensive line coaching, developing. Now, how on earth can we back that up? How do you know that we're not just blindly saying that? And how can we take a commit from a guy that's ranked in the 1200s and still be hopeful that he's going to be a really strong player here one day. Well, I will tell you exactly why, friends. Guys, Jim Mahalchek, in the last two, sorry, in the last three years, he's coached two Joe Moore semifinalist units. The Joe Moore Award is for best offensive line in the country. He's had two units placed in the top 12. All right, let's look at the tackles. From those two units, he had one in 2023 last year, and then another in 2021 a few years ago. Joshua Gray, all right, he was their left tackle, number 814 overall prospect, number 64 overall offensive tackle in the country when he was a recruit. And all that Joshua Gray has done the last two years is be a Pac 12 all second team left tackle again, back to back seasons anchoring a great Beavers offense, whether it's passing attack, rushing attack, really strong left tackle. Now let's go, go to a guy that you may already know of. This is Talise Fuaga. Hope I say that name right. I got to say the name with confidence one of these times. Today is not that day. But nevertheless, he comes to Jim Maholchek, Oregon State, as a six foot five, 320-pound prospect, just like Justin Bell. Big canvas to work with for an offensive line coach. Fuaga was ranked even lower than where Justin Bell is. 1,608th overall, the 129th offensive tackle in the country is who Jim Holchek got. Now, what did he turn him into? Other than a right tackle on a Joe Moore semifinalist unit, a team that was really good for the last few years. Well, how about Mr. Fuaga being the number 14 overall pick in last year's NFL draft? All right, last year he landed himself on five first-team All-American lists. Landed on six second-team All-American lists. All Pac-12 first-team last year. He was second-team the year prior. Point blank, what more evidence do you need? He turned him in to a damn good player, okay? Now, granted, at right tackle, we'll wait and see where Justin Bell is going to be listed at. But let's pull out one more offensive tackle that Jim Maholchek helped mold. We're going to go back to 2021. Brandon Kipper, okay? Out of high school. He was outside the top 2,000. This kid was a two-star. Started at Hawaii. He was actually listed as a linebacker recruit. But nevertheless, comes to Oregon State. Bang. Right there. Semifinals. And also, anchored as a left tackle. The uh, Or no, he was a right tackle for this one. I apologize. Oregon State that year was in the top 10 for sacks against. All right, They only averaged 1.1 sacks against per uh, in the games. Sorry, I'm just blurting these words out. I'll try this again. Their opponents averaged 1.1 sacks per game in 2021. That was a much cleaner way of saying that. That was top 10 in the country. Okay, Joshua Gray on one end, Brandon Kipper on the other end. Brandon Kipper also landing as an undrafted free agent to Baltimore. So, I mean, he did have a cup of coffee in the league, but nevertheless, guys, this is just a long way of saying there is reason to trust Jim Holchek when it comes to offensive line recruiting. I mean, we've talked about a lot offensive line recruiting earlier this week and hey maybe why he does like certain players and maybe why he does like certain players but if he has someone that he likes he's going to hone in on him and we're just going to trust him blindly so right now after those four commits where do things stand for michigan state for the 2025 class that'd be 14 commits just like that, we just went from 10 to 14 in the blink of an eye. Rivals has them ranked as the number one 41 class in the country, number 11 in the conference. So still middling in the Big Ten Conference, still all three stars. But right now, okay, you still have your bedrock foundation. And we're going to go into some numbers here. This will be your third time hearing these numbers this week. But this is hammering the point home of what Jonathan Smith and his strategy is here recruiting at Michigan State because it was also his strategy at Oregon State. Now, of course, we're just going to, you know, use a comparison for a coach that we know, Mel Tucker, 
Okay, his last class, the 2023 class, in June of 2022, when he was having all of his official visits, he had 38 official visitors on campus, all right? Seven of those guys were commits or eventually committed. So he went seven for 38 on those June official visits. June is a massive month for official visits. That, that's why we're pulling that out, if you didn't know, if you just think I'm pulling out a random month right there. Right now, for Michigan State, 27 official visits happen in the month of June. All right, 14 were commits or already have committed. That is over half of your official visits that you used turned into commits or were already commits. That is efficient. When we talk about Jonathan Smith being deliberate, intentional, efficient, I'm not just pulling that word out of my you-know-what and saying it blindly. No, that is his strategy. A lot of dialogue was had about the last two shows is that he's not going to have you on campus as an official visitor. He's not going to throw his hat in the ring unless he has a legitimate good feeling about the prospect of landing one of these kids. Sure, you might disagree with that strategy. I'm just here to tell you that is what the strategy is. So, yes, Mel Tucker, a few summers ago, 38 kids on campus, only get seven commits out of that, whereas now okay, 27 kids visited, 14 commits. And that is a pattern. If this is your first show of the week, I'll say the numbers for you. If this is your third show this week, I'm sorry, you're going to hear these numbers one more time. But at Oregon State in his last class, guys, 27 visits and 14 commits eventually happen. Same numbers as where we're at with Michigan State right now. Even the year before that, 28 visits. So under 30 visits, 11 commits from those visits. So that is how he rolls. If he does not think he has a legitimate shot of getting you or that is too big of a mountain to climb and the percentages are so low, he's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. But again, maybe that doesn't you know sit well with some people is that it might right now seem like he's only settling for three-star talent and that's all that he's you know, comfortable with right now. We're going to get to a mailbag question. And Adam writes in a question that a lot of people – Wrote a similar question to this, but here we go. I wanted to get some of the updated. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Guys, I'm jumping ahead of my notes here. Adam actually wrote in because why am I talking about official visits and why does he have such a low number of official visits? Why did he want to have under 30 official visits for the month of June? A few shows ago, I said that, well, each program has a certain number of visits that they can have in a calendar year. I pulled out the number 56. That was the wrong number. That was an outdated number. So Adam wrote in this, I wanted you to get some updates on official visits. It used to be 56 official visits and could roll over up to six per year. However, the NCAA tested last cycle, 70 total with no rollover and have since made that permanent. So shout out to Adam, listener Adam. It's actually 70 official visits per year that you can have. Those also count towards transfer portal prospects. So that's why Jonathan Smith is being stingy, I guess, for lack of a better term of like, you know, who he wants on campus. Now, now, now we have more to play with in the fall here. I'm going to get to that here in a hot second, but really quick, other recruiting news to keep on your radar for this weekend. Uh, these are three visitors from the last month that are committing very soon. Sherrod Henderson, he's going to be committing on Sunday, six foot three, 210 pound rush. It's between Michigan State and Duke. However, three crystal balls on 24 7 sports pointing to Virginia Tech, the third team in his final three. Darius Afalava, okay, that's a really good uh, interior offensive lineman from the state of Utah. He's committing at 5 30 p.m. on Friday. He's between Michigan State, obviously. Washington, Utah, Tennessee, and Oklahoma at the time of recording. There are no predictions on 24-7 sports, on three or rivals, so it's anyone's guess as to where Mr. Afalava is going to go. And then Houston Torres, out of the Hawaiian Islands, he will be committing on Sunday between Michigan State, Arizona State, Nebraska, and Utah. So, Stay tuned for that one. Um, guys, we will be getting into some basketball news here in a hot second. And then, my goodness gracious, uh, yeah, Notre Dame, Michigan State, that rivalry is renewed. But first, need to talk your ears off about Fan Duel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook. And oh, I'm loving it even more today because that's right, I bet Akshay Batia. Rocket Mortgage Classic first round leader at 40 to 1. And someone on this podcast hit that bet finally. 
How many bets have I done for the leader after the first round of a PGA tournament? Uh, who's to say? It's got to be north of 80, but finally I hit one, so there we go. We also have Mr. Patia to win the whole Rocket Mortgage Classic. Go ahead, get all the betting done over there on FanDuel for that. Guys, I also love sports, and I love them so much. But, yes, I, I just talked about golf, but as the playoffs for basketball and hockey wind down, we're getting fewer games, and the sports aren't sporting the way that we want them to. But like I said, FanDuel lets me keep going and betting on sports whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood, which is quite often, especially during golf season, especially after you have a nice little win to start a golf tournament. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. It's FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Now, I damn near fell out of my chair when I saw this news come across the timeline on Wednesday night. Justin Thin of uh, 24-7 Sports, the first to break this one. Go follow Justin Thin. Fantastic gentleman over there. Um, my goodness gracious. Uh, J Jeremy Fears actually got granted a red shirt by the NCAA for missing, well, I, more than half the season after his tragic uh, incident that happened when he was back home in Chicago getting shot in the leg. Of course, as we all know, missed the rest of the year. But, I mean, as I, I thought we all knew, I, I thought that the NCAA always butchers these kind of decisions. Like, I thought that, you know, they would have no sympathy for a kid that was just hanging out at a house and all of a sudden someone with a mask comes in, shoots him in the leg, and not only is he lucky enough to live, but unfortunately has to miss the rest of his season. My goodness gracious. Uh, shout out to, uh, to Tom Izzo for pulling some strings here. I don't know how aggressive he had to be here, but yeah. The clock starts next year for Jeremy Fierce. He's got four more years of eligibility. I Maybe I shouldn't be shocked because, again, like we're about to watch guys like like Hunter Dickinson, for an example, play his eighth year of college basketball just because he played for six minutes during a COVID season. So I, maybe they're getting a little looser with who they grant redshirts to, but we are very happy and very fortunate to have Jeremy Fierce for, yeah, up to four more years in East Lansing. He's going to be here until 2027, 2028, potentially. Now, you know what? We're going to tease a little interview here that's going to be dropping next week. We talked with Steven Izzo. That's right, fan favorite. That's going to be a full show next week. Sat down with us for a little over 30 minutes. We talked about, well, who's going to be a leader on next year's team? Like, anyone showing the inkling or the itch to be a leader? And instantly, he said Jeremy Fears. So, sorry to spoil that answer right now. But, yes, it might feel like it's Jeremy Fears' time because, by all accounts, inside the halls and inside the walls of that locker room, Everyone else gets the feeling that, yes, Jeremy Fears is ready to not just be, you know, the leader proverbially on the court since he's a point guard. But, yes, it seems like that that will be your captain of the ship moving forward up to four years. How great is that? Now, he is not playing in Moneyball this summer. And there's been some chatter about that. You know, we've got a few questions like, hey, are we concerned about this? Point blank, my answer is no. Now, am I bummed? Yes, of course I am. Am I a little like, ah, eh, oh, hope his recovery, his recovery is going as good as it seems to be? Uh, of course. You know, we're not going to know who Jeremy Fears is until that next uh, year begins, right? But I'm not too worried about this because the reason he's missing it, if you don't already know this, there is an NCAA rule that in off-season tournaments or seasons like this, you can only have up to two teammates on your college team per team in Moneyball, for example. So, six teams. 12 scholarship guys, one has to get left off. It's going to be the guy that is rehabbing a serious injury from last year. Now, I will say, like, Jeremy Fierce himself has posted on social media, even back in May, of him playing, like, pickup games. And they seem like more intense pickup games than you would even find at Moneyball. So, am I concerned? I, well, of course, there's always a baseline concern with how Jeremy Fierce is doing. Like, let's just get that out of the way right there. A guy got shot in the leg for crying out loud. Um, just as a human you're hoping he's doing okay. But as a basketball player, like, yeah, of course, that we're a little concerned. But does him missing Moneyball add more concern to that? I, no, I quite frankly don't think so. I think it's just precautionary. And if you're going to have one guy on scholarship miss it, I, just make it him. Just, for, just do everyone a favor because, oh, man, you'd feel really stupid about yourself if, um, yeah, he turned out to take a step back in his recovery because he played a little bit at Moneyball. Let's just... Let's just make that not even a possibility or, you know, having a chance of that even happen. So, uh, you know, really quick, 
I speak in green and white. Uh, you know what? This is one of the mailbag questions we got. He wrote in two questions. We're going to get to one of them right now because well, we're on the topic of red shirts right now. He says, who, if any, will be redshirted for basketball? I think we will have more people than last year, so I feel like some people should be redshirted. Fascinated to know that answer, and that is why we need in basketball, like, hey, you can play up to eight games or ten games and still maintain your red shirt. Kind of like football, how you can play up to four games. Because, like, this year, I, I think everyone on this team will have a role in a way, even guys like Kurt Tang or uh, Jesse McCulloch. You know, like, let's say that, hey, you know, they can really use a stretch four. He comes along early. I think he can have a role on this team, you know, some spot minutes here and there. But will he play all 30-some games? Doubtful. Could be a thing where he only plays in, like, 15 games. But I, So my guess, actually, is no one redshirts this year. Which, you know, it sounds you know, a little strange because we just had Garrett Norman do it last year, so maybe it's all the rage. But no, I I, I think that all the freshmen will play, and obviously uh, Frankie Fiddler, Simon Sapala, they didn't transfer here just to not play. So yeah, I think all three uh, freshmen will end up playing this year one way or another for Michigan State. But that's a strong question. We're going to try to have a basketball mind on here. I'm not going to say who because I don't want to put pressure on them, but I, we will save that question for them and pick their brain o- over whether they think that there will be red shirts this year. All right, to end this show, guys, we're going to talk about the future. 2026, 2027, you probably already saw the news, but yes, Michigan State, Notre Dame, the rivalry is renewed. Coming off of a, it, what will be nearly a 10-year hiatus because the last game, 2017, and uh, that game is unfortunately unforgettable for me because the... The tailgate was like 111 degrees Fahrenheit, it felt like. But yeah, I remember that game was 14 to 0 before the, the band could even all take their seats. That was uh that was a tough game for uh Michigan State here. The rest of the season went fine. It was a pretty good season. And Ten wins for crying out loud. But yeah, that was a forgettable game for Michigan State. And unfortunately, the last game against Notre Dame until 2026, that is. Now uh two thoughts. Came to mind when I saw this graphic pop across Twitter that, yes, this rivalry is renewed. It's coming, and it's coming soon. My first reaction was, like, I'm actually kind of surprised. You know, Not to make this whole third segment just all about surprises that I have, but, yeah, I, I am a little surprised because for both teams to agree to this game because in a college football world where making the playoff is paramount to any in-season game, to any non-conference game, to even, like, making bowl games. Like, you got to be one of the 12 best teams – I, I'm surprised both teams signed up for such a difficult non-conference game. I mean, you are you are sacrificing a chip shot to play in a competitive game like this. Like I personally, me and call me a loser. Uh, I would much rather try to get Holy Cross on the schedule than it would Notre Dame. Like the, getting those automatic wins, air quotes around that early on in your season. I think can be important moving forward, especially when it comes to building the resume either for a college football playoff. Because hey, if you have more than two losses. I, the history of the college football rankings shows that you're essentially eliminated from that top 12. Uh, it's not a perfect science, but it is very close to it. So, yeah. But, hey, you know what? Don't don't look at me and just think that I'm, like, totally upset because, you know, there is a part of me, and there's maybe a big part of you, that is actually feeling very good about this. That, oh, my God, finally, we're in, in a world where all of our college football traditions are being stripped away from us, everything's just being corporate, and watered down, at least we're getting something that we know, something that is storied, one of the oldest rivalries in college football back on the map. There, it, That is very cool that, okay, when everything else is burning around us, at least we have that beacon to look forward to. That is college football as we know it. Both teams just going for it. And besides, hey, if you win those games, that's going to be really nice on your resume. So, yeah, I mean – but maybe you are wondering why they're setting themselves up for a potential loss. Either team here, Notre Dame or Michigan State, because, it, again, you cannot afford more than two losses. Or, guys, I maybe it's not even the college football playoff on your mind, but let's go back two years. Michigan State, they go to Washington. They get buzzsawed. We all remember that game. And how about the rest of the season where you came one game short of making a bowl game? Now, I know that wouldn't be the sexiest bowl game. It would be like the first responders bowl or the serve pro bowl or – the University Wiener Bowl. I don't know what it was, but like a bowl game, in my opinion, call me crazy, is a lot better than not a bowl game. So you're probably better off playing a team like, I don't know, Eastern Washington as opposed to Washington. I like, again, this might sound like loser talk, but I just take the automatic wins where you can get them. Again, 
I'm not totally poo-pooing this. I'm legitimately surprised, and that is why I am surprised. Don't give me your, I will be fired up once this game eventually rolls around, but I'm like, whoa. Wow, I, th I thought we were just doing like three chip shots uh, to start this game. Now, the second thought I had, I will say this. It's like, am I crazy? Like, wasn't this rivalry matchup for 2026 and 27 already announced? Like, why is everyone treating this like it's new news? If you are one of those people, I am here to say you are vindicated because I went back and like, there are articles as far back as like 2019 that talk about this game. I think it was treated as like this groundbreaking, newsbreaking story because they actually finally have hard dates for this. Uh, the dates being September 19th for the 2026 game at Notre Dame and then September 18th at Michigan State. So I believe those would be like week four games. Um, but yeah, like if, if you thought that you were losing your marbles and you thought that you were in an alternate reality where that was already set in stone, guys, it, it has already been set in stone for a few years. So um, yeah, I just, just want to clear the air on that, I guess. But yeah, so that's a trip down my brain right there to end this show. And to end this week, folks, we will be back. Again, we're going to be hitting the mail back hard next week. We got Steven Izzo lined up for next week. Al Karsten's going to appear on the show here in the near future. Keep it tuned. Locked on Sparns. And above all, hey, have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves. Love you all. Go Green.